Hey everyone, you're listening to Film Philosophy, where we break down the philosophies, concepts, and structures of filmmaking in the American film industry. We are filmmakers Tiffany Francis, Andrew Coles, and Nzinga Murray. Film Philosophy is brought to you by The Mission Entertainment. Today's episode features Linda Yvette Chavez, and the topic that we are tackling is cultural box. Chavez made her first big splash in the entertainment industry in 2020 with a groundbreaking, critically acclaimed, award-nominated series, Hentified, which she co-created and helmed as co-showrunner, director, and executive producer. Hentified was praised for navigating larger themes of gentrification and the marginalization of Latinxes in America, and during its run was nominated for a prestigious Peabody Award, 10 Imagine Foundation Awards, including Best Comedy Series and Best Directing for Chavez, and a GLAAD Media Award nomination for Outstanding Comedy Series. Seasons 1 and 2 of the show can currently be streamed on Netflix. Chavez recently inked a multi-year overall deal with 20th Television, where she is creating her own projects for Disney's various platforms. We chose Linda for this topic of cultural box because she has made it her mission to tell Latinx stories on screen for all backgrounds, not just for her community. And I think that's really important to distinguish, especially right now when we need executives to understand that our voices aren't limited to apply just to only our community. And I think there's a huge opportunity for a wealth of new stories. So without further ado, here is Linda Yvette Chavez. Hi, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, hey. Yay, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into it. Linda, can you talk to us about what it means to be placed in a cultural box as the industry tends to do with diverse writers or creators? And let's face it, everyone else in the industry, unfortunately. So how would you describe what that means? And I know that you want to make content for all backgrounds. So what is it like to be pigeonholed to do only one type of cultural storyline? Yeah, I mean, I think from top to bottom, even from within Latine storytelling, I think right out the gate, and Andrew can attest to that in Zinga, but, you know, I tend to always get the skirts about narcos and like border crossing, which, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but it is, you know, getting pigeonholed into a certain type of story within Latine storytelling. And then beyond that, as like an EP, and someone who's trying to develop content with newer creators, I think there's always the assumption that the stories I want to tell are solely Latinx stories. And the reality is, is like I like I say, I grew up in Norwalk, which is not that far from um, downtown L.A. And I grew up with a lot of people, not just Mexicans, not just Latinos. I grew up with black folks, with Asian American folks. My, my best friends are Filipino, Vietnamese. Some were refugees. Others were, you know, that that experience also um influence my experience right and so my interests are kind of run the gamut because of that and I think ultimately what I seek to tell the stories I seek to tell are just those of people who've been underrepresented who need access who have stories that are just important to tell um and I think in the industry oftentimes folks don't I think they just want me to tell those Latino stories and I think it's because there's so few of us in positions of power the way that I am the you know the the bit of power that I do have and they want us to do the ones that are Latino and beyond that I know that you know culturally or numbers wise Latinx people are growing quickly and they represent a big portion of moviegoers and tv viewers and so they're growing fast and they have a lot of money and so they want Latino stories Latinx stories and and, you know, and so then oftentimes, like, that's what's being pushed for. And that's good because those are stories I want to tell, too. But, you know, I'm also just a creator and a person who's an artist. And I'm moved by stories not and by art, not necessarily by numbers and money. And so, you know, it gets hard when you're like, hey, think of me for the certain things that maybe they wouldn't think of. Like, I, I was trying to convince this woman last year. She was Vietnamese-American who had um, this really cool story. It was, like, 80s like music it was just really cool and I was just like that's awesome because the, the world that she was looking at was Orange County areas and those were stories I grew up with so I resonated with them and I was just kind of like this is really cool let's let's do it but oftentimes it's like oh well you tell Latino stories right so it's it's even that 
it's even beyond that. It's like, well, we want a partner maybe who is more culturally connected to this, right? So, you know, I think it's all of the above. It's a it's a thing that I don't think white folks have to deal with, right? Like, they get put on every project because their power is something that everyone needs because they've been holding it for so long above all of us, right? Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. That does make sense. Well- I I think there's something so interesting in that last point that you brought up. And I think there was so much that you touched on, but this idea of the assumption of who gets to tell what stories. And I think because of the historical walls that kept people of color from self-representation in Hollywood, and that we are only as filmmakers, perhaps in the second or third generation of storytellers, that have access. It's it's yeah. interesting because if we go back and think about, you know, black face and brown face and yellow face, there was a point in time where it was like, well, we've got to get a white person to play this role because who else could play it? And so for so long within I think the writing and the direction and the producing of stories, there's the assumption of like, oh, well, we can get somebody white to do this because that's what we've been doing. And there's a lack of cultural humility that exists in terms of the understanding A I am not only empowered, you know, and uh, able to tell the stories within my community, but I also as a human being have access to what it is, you know, to be a human being. And that's what I look for in the universality, the universality of the stories that I'm telling. So I think that that point of the assumption that I as a black man can't tap into what it is that makes a white woman a human being is a gross underestimation of the fact that at the end of the day, there's a lot of similar things. Like if we think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, as human beings, we all need some very basic and fundamental shared things, regardless of our race, regardless of our orientation, regardless of any of the other factors. And it's, 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 it's for me, it's, it's the question of how do we break through those assumptions? That was a big inspiration for you know, the foundation of the Mission Entertainment which the goal was, hey, we want to tell stories about people who have been historically underrepresented, and we want to work with a broad swath of creators who can speak to a broad variety of experiences. And it was at a time in the industry where there weren't any other companies doing that. But I I had an agent say, she was a partner at an agency, and she said when I told her about the mission, I was like, hey, it's an intersectional production company. She's like, oh, so you're just going to do the black stuff. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, well, yeah, I'm going to do black stuff because I love black stuff and I love black people. But my goal is to work with a broad variety of creators. And so I think that experience, I'm, I'm curious, Linda, for you, is like, was there a key moment that stood out for you where you realized the ways in which people felt more comfortable placing you within a box or having a more limited understanding of who you are as a storyteller? Yeah, I mean, like, it's always just like what you just described, right? It's like always the the automatic. It's like, so you're going to tell Latino stories. And granted, like, I come out the gate with that heart. I'm not going to lie. Like, I'm always like, I want to tell Latino stories. So, like, you know, I get it. Um, But I think any time that even within the same breath, people will then make us, will then assume that, like, oh, well, you don't want to be put up for this project that is, like, maybe a really big project with a really big name. Like I've had to have like a lot of conversations, you know, with agents and folks about like, Hey, I really want to do X, Y, Z. Um, and no fault of their own. They're like, Oh, like we thought you just wanted to do very specific niche things. Right. So then in the, in some ways it's not, it's I, I understand it because it's like, Oh, the assumption is like, well, you've been saying this is what you want to do. But I think, the default to assume that something at that level could not be have Latino characters added to it or be looked at in it from through a Latine lens or that I wouldn't be able to bring other layers of information to the project, I think is part of the the thing. I think there's also been situations where I've been brought in on projects because they're like, oh, she'll come in and sprinkle the Latino flavor to it. And the reality is I've come in and been like, hey, this is not a structurally sound script. Like, this is not a you know, strong story, like these characters are underdeveloped. It's like, I'm not just bringing in the spicy sauce that you guys want into the (laughs) script or the story. Like I'm actually bringing you like character arc. My strongest skill is character and developing character and having strong characters. And, and I can do that across the gamut, but yeah, I, I do think that that's 
it's just really common and sometimes you're for me anyway sometimes I don't even know what's happening until I realize it's happening mm. or I'm like what is it why does this keep like why do I keep getting sent this or why am I not putting, being put up for those things um and then once you realize oh it's because of that or even as a woman like there's often I've had to go through the process of like why does this keep happening and then you're like oh it's because I'm a woman or because of I'm both right it's like these are even our own awareness of it happening is kind of we don't even know it because you sometimes you'll have people who are direct like this woman Andrew that you had who will be like oh you're gonna do the black stuff not everyone is that like audacious to like tell you straight up so sometimes they do things unconsciously or without telling you and then you're like why do they keep doing that and you and you're like oh it's because they have these unconscious biases that they're not even aware that they're you know aware of that they're doing these things so yeah I mean like that's also relatable and and I think in terms of who gets to tell stories back to what I was saying before I think it's also like it's interesting to me that if you say maybe this is not the right comparison because Ryan Murphy is a certain level if you say like a person of color takes a project to Ryan Murphy and he executive produces it it's like wow Ryan Murphy's executive producing this project for you right but if I brought something to Ryan Coogler and they were like, why? People would say, why? Right? They would say, like, why not Eva Longoria? Why not someone else? Why not a Latino? Mm. Like, that's the, it gets questioned versus, like, yeah, but he's an artist who relates to this particular type of material that I'm doing and the storytelling I'm trying to tell. So, like, why not him? Why not? Because I'm excited about him as an artist that I get to have him be the person who he pieces, I mean, like, hence the being at Macro, like, that's Charles King's company, and it's, you know, maybe some people might have found it strange that the first in-house projection they had was Hentified, right? Like, the, it's the same assumption that, that they made about you, Andrew, like, well, Charles is going to do black stories, right? And they came in with, like, no, we're doing all types of stories from all backgrounds, and our project was one of the ones who, that came through the door, right? And I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud, and I feel like we got to tell the story we wanted to tell because he understood that we needed to be the ones to tell it. And, like, I didn't need him to be Latino. I didn't need the people behind it to be not Latino necessarily to allow us to do that, you know? And, you know, obviously America was a part of it, and she understood things in an even more personal way. But every everyone's different because sometimes you can have BIPOC folk be helping you and still, and they not get it not get what you're doing you know like it's it's always it's about like what makes sense for your work and what resonates with you so i mean yeah i i think to that point it's it's that (laughs) distinction of can we be viewed as artists in our own right and that idea of the flattening out of well you do this or you do that or those are the stories that you can tell it is um you know, what is it? What is the phrase? The soft bigotry of low expectations. It's like, if you think this is all that I can Mm. do. I've never heard that before. Yeah. I forget. I forget whose, (laughs) whose quote that was, but it's, it's this idea of, Oh, like, I think this idea, and and we've talked about it some Linda, this, you know, all the questions that I get, or, you know, you, the questions you've gotten are, you know, about being a artist of color rather than, just about mm-hmm. the craft rather than just about being an artist. And I wonder if because of the history of Hollywood, there is a flattening that happens to our artistic identities and also to the identities of a project so that it's not, oh, this is a family drama or this is a story of, you know, some cousins who are getting together and trying to figure out how to live their lives, you know, and push their family legacy forward. But it's, oh, well, this is a Latin story or this is a black story, like rather than you know, the actual genre that it's in. It's like black movies is not a genre. It's a, it's a category. Yeah. <laughs> like Latin stories, like it's not a genre. It's like, oh yeah, it's a, it's a subsection. It's a tag on that. Um, but I wonder is, is that something that, and, and Tiffany, I'm curious if, if you faced it as well. It's like, is that something that y'all have felt is frustrating? Yeah. I mean, of course, 100%. I always feel frustrated about, you know, that flattening that you're you're speaking of. It's so interesting though, because like Linda, you made a point of like when someone brings something to a white creator, it's like it's okay. Something that's cultural brings it to a white creator. Oh my god, that's the gold mine, right? You found the right creator. But then when you bring something cultural to someone who has a different culture background, it's like, oh why? You know, like I think we're at such a nuanced place in our cultural, like, I don't know, sort of like standpoint of how we get viewed in terms of Like if an Asian American creator 
made a story about black people it's like why (laughs) people get upset but then if someone who's white makes a story about black people they're praised because they've stepped outside of their own box and i think people just love to pigeonhole creators and make them feel like oh but why like they they question it even more you know what i mean just like you were saying john chu for making in the heights right like that was a huge thing people got really upset about that and i'm trying to think of other stories like after sun and barry jenkins was connected to that no one batted an eye it's a scottish story and it's i don't know there's things like that that are so interesting to me those like little cultural nuances and why we get like dinged for making something that's just slightly outside of our own box yeah it's, it's complex i mean thinking about this makes, it makes me think of a project that i had with two creators who are of afro-caribbean descent who are doing a story that I, i'm me painting about west african mythology and i've known about the story forever because one of the they're both my friends but one of them had started a years ago and you know i've always been so intrigued by it and i always felt like it was such a cool story and i was always supportive of him and like giving him notes and giving him advice for how to get it made and then at some point i had this kind of gut feeling of like i want to like i want to like really help like i want to like help executive produce it and but i think i resisted helping or resisted putting myself up for it because i will always say who is the right person to tell the story right is this the best creator the best writer the best director to tell the story are they close enough to the material does it make sense um so i'll always say no to a project if it doesn't feel like i should be the one telling it and in this case because it was two black creators and also my friends you know i i had the opportunity to say hey listen like i really love it i want to help you guys get the best partner possible i'm interested too but i totally understand if you don't think that i'm the right executive producer for this project i just want you to know that i love it and if you feel like there's a world in which i can help the two of you as creators tell your story and can bring my like expertise to it then like amazing if not i get it let me help you find the right person right mhm and right away they were both like oh my god linda please like they want they i think they were just so comfortable with me and like you know i just have a way about me with like mentorship and all that and i think that they were feeling like we feel comfortable with you we feel like you're going to let us tell our story the way that we want to tell it and you're going to protect us while we do it. and that really is what i like to do when i'm helping creators it's not it's like i fell in love with the thing that you've made i just was having this conversation with someone recently who asked me like how would you want to change these all the things and things like that and i was like well i'm not the creator you are i fell in love with what you're telling me already and I, my job is just to help like help you find it and then protect it like that's that's what i'm here to do right so you know in the same way that like potentially a rhyme i don't know him personally but a rhyme murphy or another big ep might do for some creators um it's the same thing to me in my head as long as those folks who are telling that story feel like that comfort level feel like yes linda we feel like you are the right person for this and we are approving of this and we want your support in this so yeah i mean like I just get excited about stories and so like it's just like oh this is so cool like and I also feel like be having gone through the industry having made my own show there's just so much shit that you go through there's so much and I think you know regardless of your your background your race it's hard regardless you is white black yellow everything like it's hard but add the layer of being a person of color there are not enough resources and people in the industry to help folks like us navigate the craziness of this industry and so it's sort of like college remember where there was always like the one professor that all of the bipoc kids would go to and I was like there's only one latina professor we all have to get her to be our advisor and the poor professor was just like oh my god i'm so exhausted i kind of feel that like that now in the industry but also <laughs> i think like that limits how we can all help each other in some ways right mm-hmm. um i ended up my advisor in college ended up being the one black professor in the theater department um because it just ended up that way and he was incredible and he really basically his name harry elam i always shout him out because he basically introduced me to the work that i do like activism and like art for activism and and he really he changed my life he he basically made my career so if i had not if i had said if i had limited myself and he had limited himself like i would not be here doing what i'm doing right mm-hmm. 
So I think like there's just there's ways that we can all help each other if we choose to, right? Because no one's required or responsible to do it. But if we want to have that freedom, we should be allowed that freedom. And I think that speaks to your topic of being pigeonholed. It's when people don't give you the freedom to be fully the artist that you're supposed to be, then you're limiting the outcomes that could be really amazing. Like what if there isn't someone else who wants to help this project become what it needs to be? Like, but I'm here to do it. I'm here to support. So let's do it. Yeah. Let's make it happen. Maybe it's going to be a huge hit. Like, awesome. <laughs> I'm happy that I got to be a part of it. The way that Charles was a part of my story, the way that Harry was a part of my story, Andrew and Zinga are part of my story. Like, that's all, that's all part of it. Mm-hmm. 100%. Yes. Yeah. Yes to freedom <laughs> and yes to supporting each other and I think actually there's an interesting effect which is like I get sent some scripts that are just about being Asian (laughs) like literally just about being Asian American or something and I'm like okay but what does it actually connect with in terms of me and my personality and my sense of like my sentiments you know like does it actually fit who I am as an artist and I think what you're saying like the flattening out of you know just who we are I think that's a big part of it too is like people don't look beyond the fact that and I don't match every single Asian American story just because I'm Asian American, <laughs> you know? And I think that's really interesting. I hope people can be a little bit more cognizant of this in the future is that just because we have something in common, which is our ethnicity or background or something, it doesn't mean that fits us as an artist and our, that we're meant to do something. Like I want to be brought stories that are, that have nothing to do with being Asian American sometimes. As long as I, really can vibe with the story and like the the characters and their arc you know or if it's a type of story that I'm really into and I think that's where the limitation comes from as well is that we literally are checking a box for people people love to just easily send us stuff that they think oh you're gonna match this because of this you know and I think that's that's something we really got to address. There's one thing I want to say and that it's interesting. It's the idea. It's like, if we think about, you know, movies in the history of Hollywood, it's like how many of them are just solely about a white person being white, like are based in just like, Hey, this is the identity of white. it's like, no, it's just what it is to be a human being. And then something happens to them and their identity is often not necessarily thought of because whiteness is the default within, you know, Hollywood, but it's this idea of, Oh, we're just watching a story of someone who's struggling to, make the payments or get to this place or, you know, achieve whatever their goal is. And I think it's, again, this idea of how can we be seen as artists who take in the same influences and the same inspirations as our counterparts? You know, it's like growing up as a filmmaker, it's like Akira Kurosawa, massive influence on me. Like, do I love Spike Lee's movies? Yes, a lot of them. But I also love Sidney Lumet and this idea of Mm -hmm. we can only be spoken to by art that is created by people that look like us is such a limiting way to look at the world. And, you know, I think all of us in our individual ways are in love with different facets of storytellers and have been inspired by different folks. And that makes its way into our work, regardless of the ethnicity or background of, you know, the protagonist of that story. Yeah, like I'm a big fan of Scorsese. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't think people would think that, you know, like, <laughs> like if I, like my first, my first short film, like was so influenced by Goodfellas. Mm. Like it's just, I was so obsessed because I just took some random like semester full class of his at USC. And, you know, I, t- I think he just took, took it because I was like, oh, I have to take a class to fulfill some requirement. Um, but I fell in love with like the symbolism in his work and like, you know, obviously, you know, there's a lot to critique, but like ultimately I was just like, oh, wow, I really relate to his experience and why he told the stories he was telling and how telling these particular stories about these people he kind of grew up with could be upsetting to some folks, right? I mean, like, obviously it's exaggerated what he does, but it could be upsetting for folks to see those those representations and think, which is what he went through, right? It's like, oh, you're making Italians look a certain way, right? You're making it, t-. but it's like, but that was his experience. And those were the representations that he grew up with and that he was trying to explore through his own art, through his own heart. And that was something I related to. Like the first, my first short film was about gang life and about like being jumped into a gang and like, and colorism and all these things that like I had grown up with. And like, you know, someone might look at that and be like, oh God, another, another thing about whatever. But like, that was me as an artist feeling like I got to process the thing that I grew up with and that I went through. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I related to him, (laughs) his wife, his, you know, 
old Italian man. And of course he's a brilliant and everybody loves his work. Right. But the reasons for why I related to his work were very specific to me and my experience, right. Specific to being a little Chicana girl growing up in LA and like dealing with like a very similar thing to him living in New York growing up the way that he did. So that's, you know, an example of how like art really transcends and it's really about like what, and also the Catholicism and the symbolism in his work was another thing because I grew up very Catholic and like there's just a lot of layers mm-hmm. that like are part of me that aren't solely, and maybe also even because I am Latina, but yet I can still relate to his story because we had a similar, it, it's interesting, I was traveling this summer and I was in Croatia and <laughs> One of and when we got there, one of the drivers told us that I was like, oh, what well, languages are spoken here? He's like, oh, Croatian. He's like, in, in English, obviously. And then he's like, oh, and Spanish, but not. But he's like, but for weird reasons. And I was like, why? He's like, oh, everyone here loves telenovelas. And I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, Mexican telenovelas are huge here. He's like, and, and everyone grows up with them, so everyone knows at least a little bit of Spanish. And I was like, not because you guys are close to Spain. He was like, no, because of novelas. And I was like, that is so weird. <laughs> And then I met another a tour guide who, like, was, like, talking to us in Spanish. And all her phrases were, like, straight up from telenovelas. And I was like, wow. <laughs> but, like, she loved it. And she was like, oh, it reminds me of, like, this this family member. reminds me of that. And that's why I love traveling because it's just the, the amount of identities are, and experiences are so infinite. And I think sometimes mm-hmm. in the States we get stuck in our little worlds. Oh, yeah. And we get stuck in the idea of who we are and these, these boxes that we're talking about, right? We've been taught, you're this, you're that, you're that. And I think when you travel, you're like, whoa, there are infinite possibilities. Like, this is everything everywhere all at once. Like, we can de- we can be everything. And I think that's beautiful. It's just such a reminder that we get to be more than what the world or what society is telling us to be. Absolutely. Thank you so much for laying all of that out for us. How have you seen the cultural box limit other writers that maybe you've worked with or that you know and like how has it limited the work that's been put out so far like has it had a negative impact on people or cultural like you're saying maybe just America in general (laughs) what do you what do you think yeah I mean I think in particular the first thing that comes to mind is that often a lot of work is not greenlit because it doesn't fit the cultural box that people are expecting, like not to hate on narco shows about narco traficantes, but that shit gets greenlit like that, right? Yeah. Like it's just what people know of Latina people and stories, right? Narco, narcos, narco traficantes, they're a very small percentage of 30 plus <laughs> Latin American countries, but they make up a, such a big majority of our representation mm-hmm. in television mm-hmm. and film, right? And it's, you know, I get it. It's like uh, salacious. It's like drama. It's like crime. It's all these things. But because of that, I think it makes it difficult when you have a story that's not salacious and dramatic and very like, you know, Mm -hmm. it makes it hard to get it greenlit. Like, like no one wants to see the story about the regular person doing the regular things because they're not used to non-white people having stories told about their regular lives, doing regular things or falling in love. Like, mm-hmm. I know storytellers who, are, who love rom-coms and people aren't used to getting the story that's not full of trauma and like, oh, look at all the pain I've gone through. And listen, I'm one of those people who tells her trauma and her pain through her art. I love it. I think there's a place where I think it's important. But I do think it then... Many people think that that's the only way we can exist in media Mm -hmm. is in our trauma. And I know a lot of artists and storytellers, new and old, are trying to tell stories that are different, like romantic comedies, like hard comedies, like different things that are like just about regular ass things. And they have trouble getting things greenlit or they have trouble getting into programs. I had a mentee who was like, oh, I'm going to apply to to this uh, BIPOC program film independent which I love and rep hard and he was like but all my stuff is quirky and weird and comedic like Rick and Morty type shit like I won't get in with that I don't have I didn't haven't had any I don't have real trauma to write about Mm. like that's how he felt about it and I was like wait a second like that's how we're trained we're trained to be like well if you don't have this deep you know soulful thing that you need to say then like no one's gonna care about it and I, I told him I was like it's, it's listen maybe the judges will go in that direction because I can't check everyone's biases right but what I told him was like that's who you are and we need those stories too like tell us the crazy weird quirky 
crazy stories. Like we want to hear it. I was like, apply with that and talk about your experiences feeling not quite like every other Latino in that way or the way that you think everyone thinks Latinos should be. Like tell your version of like, this is what it means to be Latino to me. Like, this is who I am. I'm a quirky kid who does all these weird, whatever. But whoever you are, it's it's different. But, like, that's okay, too. So, you know, I think those limitations against of the boxing, it, 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 it's so subconscious that you're, you're even affecting, like, a young filmmaker who's not applying because they think that the thing they're supposed to be mm-hmm. is the thing they've always seen in media, that I got to just lay out my traumas for you in order to be considered. And so, like, how are we limiting our own stories from top to bottom? Or, like, mm. creators who I've seen in the business forever who have really great stories that are not about trauma who are like I cannot get this picked up for the life of me or greenlit for the life of me or it's made it all to the, the way to the end but the execs aren't 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 greenlining it because it's not the narcos it's not the border story it's not the trauma filled East LA story right <laughs> like honestly I'll just call out my own work you know like the first time it came to me it was based in East LA and I thought oh man another East LA story and, like, thank God I was able to come in and, and Marvin and I made this, this beautiful thing and we got to say it, or tell it very authentically. But it is a complaint from the community because it is how this industry functions. It only knows, like, it only has certain buttons and it presses only those buttons over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And it's like at some point you got to be like, break the damn buttons <laughs> and, like, realize that the shit that we're all different. And, like, let's tell the stories that are actually cool and wonderful and that we love and that move us. I really love that point, and it brings to mind there's been the recent, you know, sort of cultural debate about Hassan Minaj and the idea that, you know, he in his stand up and in, you know, his television work, you know, with his Netflix show, he told stories that were embellished, were exaggerated, but he was hoping would convey an emotional truth. And, you know, I think it's a a whole other conversation to say, you know, what's the responsibility of folks who work in comedy or who work in storytelling to present stories that they happen versus having story, you know, poetic license and all of that. But what I thought was interesting was there was a comment, and I'm forgetting who said this, from someone who was basically saying, I think the thing that we really need to take away from this story is not the questions of embellishment of, of stories or poetic license or any of that, but this idea that, you know, young brown you know, Muslim storytellers feel like the best way for them to get attention and to move forward is to mine their trauma, you know, is to mine these things that have happened is to, you know, because that's what the expectation is. And it's this idea of like, if Hassan Minaj had not told those stories, would people have listened? The hope is, yes, because he's talented enough storyteller because, but it's like, when we think about how the mechanisms of power operate, you know, in this industry, who decides, well, Mm -hmm. okay, that Netflix, you know, special is getting greenlit. Okay, this TV special is getting greenlit because he tells these sorts of stories because he minds this. And so I I think to that, you know, is there an expectation for us to say, my storytelling is going to center on the trauma of what it is to be a person of color? I'm going to mine the stories for my pain. You know, there's a conversation within the black community of like, yeah, we're really tired of stories about enslaved people. Like, yes, does there need to be critical learning and thinking about the role that slavery played in the foundation of America and the wealth that was stolen by stolen labor? Yes. Do we need to see endless movies and TV shows about it? Not if they're not adding something to the conversation. But again, I think... When I wonder if when it comes to people of color, people who have been historically underrepresented within American film and television, whether the apparatus just expects that of us and doesn't necessarily have another way to look at our, our works. And so, again, the ways in which that pressure can be realized of like, oh, well, this isn't the type of black story that they want. They don't want a story about a black fanboy, you know, who X, Y, and Z, like they want oh, it was difficult to be black and it was, you know, and so I think it's, it's, it's an interesting idea to think about how much richer the storytelling environment could be if we were encouraged to tell the stories about our everyday lives. I was just on a flight and my partner was watching uh, Ashkar Farhadi's movie, A Separation, which came out in 2011 Mm -hmm. and you know, it's about a husband and wife who are going through a separation and then there's, you know, a court case, but you know, it takes place in Iran, but it's just a domestic drama. 
it's just a story of a family who's trying to figure it out and the tensions that come from it. And I remember watching that movie for the first time and in rewatching, you know, my partner's watching it on the plane. So then I'm watching it and just reading the subtitles and she's like, you want headphones? I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm just going to, I'm going to read it. But it was such a revelation because I was like, I've never seen an Iranian story like that. Like I had never just seen outside of terrorism, outside of, oh, this, this, and it was just like, yeah, like a husband and wife who have grown apart and their kids who are stuck in the middle. And like the pain of what that is. And mm-hmm. it was like, I think the more that we can see those stories from people of color, from people who have been historically underrepresented, I think it's those reminders of like, again, we're all going through similar stuff. Like the internal monologue, the beliefs about ourselves, we're all going through the same, the same stuff as human beings. And it's like, I want to see more and more of that created because- I think that in some ways fulfills the obligation that we have to audiences to not only show them an imagined world, but also to show them the real world. Yeah. Wow. You're making me think about also how like as audiences, we also expect to watch that too. Expect to see trauma. We expect to like, cause like there's a demand there, right? There's kind of a demand there too. And it's like, I'll say what it made me think of, but I'm like, I don't know if I should talk about this. Y'all can tell me afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but like, it's reminding me of the conversations I had with Netflix when they canceled our show. Um, and like when we got on a call with them and, um, you know, they read through, we wanted to know the numbers. We really pushed. We wanted to understand they wouldn't be very transparent, but they compared us to other shows and said like compared to these shows, this is what, mm-hmm. why this and that. Um, and I remember thinking at the time Squid Games games had come out and like listen I haven't I didn't watch the whole thing because I watched the first episode and it was really hard for me to see the painfulness of of what it involved but I just remember talking to them because you know I wanted them to understand that the work that they were doing was beyond numbers it was also about like what stories are you choosing to put out into the world and what does that mean right and one of the comparisons that were made was like you know this show didn't have any marketing budget. There's a thing I don't know if I could talk about, <laughs> but it's like we didn't give this show any marketing budget, right? Squid Games. One, I thought, well, that's a sad thing that you're okay with saying that you didn't give this Korean filmmaker a marketing budget for their work. That's one thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the second thing for me was what has done well. Like, there's so much in that show. There's so much trauma. There's so much pain. There's so much, you know. There's so much like seeing people of color suffer, right? And, and you know, with our show, there, there's, you know, trauma being worked through. There was a lot of, like, healing. There was a lot of, like, joy. There was a lot of family coming together. It was seeing us heal and be okay, and be okay again and, lo- and love each other again, right? And I, I questioned, I was like, ask yourselves why a show, which I, again, proud of, of the filmmaker, proud of the, the work, but I question why his audience says, why are we li- watching these traumatic things so deeply and, and they're rising up, right? Why is it harder for us to watch ourselves heal or to accept healing mm-hmm. in some ways? Um, and, and, you know, there's numbers. And I think that's why I struggle with this industry, because I think, like, on the one hand, it's a business. On the other hand, we are the people who hold the keys to the way people change the way people heal, the way people grow, like it's art and it's, it's doing what art has always done. It's influencing, right? Ultimately Mm -hmm. it's what it is. It's on a grander scale with a lot of money. Um, and that's the trouble because the business I think is in a lot of ways, um, I guess tainting that art, right? Mm -hmm. Like what? And and I, and I was questioning them because I wanted them not to be mean or to attack. I wasn't attacking. I, I was more like saying, Hey, you're part of this, this, you're part of influencing, you're part of choosing what goes into the world. And like, what does it do to people? What does it do to audiences? You can choose to say, Hey, this makes a lot of money. We're just going to keep throwing money at things that are traumatic and painful because it makes money without any real thought about like, okay, but what's that doing to people? Mm -hmm. What's it doing to what people think about people who they're seeing on screen? Like there is like the, the lack of accountability, right? Yeah. As, at every level of this industry and the way that we're trying to tell stories, it's like a lot of people are drunk on the power and the money 
and they they forget that they're doing art that influences the whole fucking world. And it's like, what are you what are you putting out there? Why are you investing in one thing more than the other? I think they can all exist because, like I said earlier, all of our stories are necessary and important. But when it's out of balance, when the balance is leaning towards the slavery stories, the border crossing stories, the narco traficantes, when the balance is in that favor, are we? What are we doing? Where 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 have we lost our souls? Mm-hmm. <laughs> where like the trauma is the thing that we like need to be someone had i saw some meme this is not a thing to quote because i don't know i think it's based on research (laughs) about horror movies you guys probably saw this too right horror movies and how it's indicative of someone's like uh, level of trauma and the therapy that they need like this need to see pain and suffering comes from like deeper things right so when you think about colonialism and slavery and all these huge things that happen around the world why are we drawn to these to this painful imagery why is that the thing that we invest the most in? Again, I'm okay with it because we need to, we all, all emotions are important, but where is, is there balance? Because when things are out of balance, as we've seen in everything in life, when things are out of balance, ain't good. So um, I don't know, I just went on a whole tangent, but and that's, <laughs> that's what you made me think of as you were talking, Andrew. That all came to mind because it's just like, oh, we don't get to, like, when we shut down the joy and the happiness, those stories, when we shut down the people who tell the rom-coms, the people who, like, from our communities, because, like, white folks, they get to do that all day, but from our communities, and there's a, a huge imbalance in the way that we're being seen in the world and the way that we're seeing ourselves mm-hmm. on screen, right? We're only seeing the one version, the suffering, and that can fuck with your mind. Imagine, like, young kids, it fucks with their minds to see that. So I think that's the work we're all trying to do, right, is to create a balance. I think what you're saying is really beautiful. and. I can relate like so much to that. And I think there's people in my community too, like, or when I say my community, I I am generally speaking for like Asian Americans, you know, like I think we limit ourselves to the types of stories that we tell as well, because we know that certain things can be greenlit, you know, like I don't know if people really want to see the everyday lives of Asian Americans and what they do and how they feel. <laughs> like, we're not there yet. People want the things that have to do with Chinese mythology or more thrilling or about Asian gangs or Asian trauma, you know? Like, do we want the, mm. the beautiful, quiet stories? I hope we get to see that more. Oh, what are, what are you going to well, say? I was just gonna, you, I, you I, no, I was just going <laughs> to say, and, and to that point, and, and I'm just interjecting because I'm excited, but it's the idea of let's 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 clarify. Do people want to see it? Yes. Do the decision makers in this industry think it will be a good return on their investment in terms of dollar for dollar? No. So I think let's not sell ourselves short because we represent each of our constituencies and we hunger for those stories. We are unique snowflakes, but also we're not unique. Like there are other people who want to see those stories. There are other people who, if those stories were created, and it's not just creating them, but then it's marketing them, it's building awareness, it's actually doing what it takes to launch a project versus just making it and being like, well, we'll put it out there. And if they find that they find it, it's like, no, you know, it requires work to bring an audience. But I think there are people who want to see these stories. There are less people who want to fund them. And, you know, Mm -hmm. we had our conversation, you know, with Edith Rodriguez, we were talking about the capitalization of content. I think when we operate in a mindset that prioritizes content or entertainment over art, and this idea of maximizing Mm -hmm. profits rather than maximizing impact. And I think, Linda, to the point that you made, is this question of what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What are we putting into the world? What are we offering to people? When the question isn't that, but it's well, what do the numbers look like? Well, can we pre-sell some foreign territories? Is this someone who has you know, known value? Is this someone who will help us make the most money possible? The stories of ordinary people, we're seeing less and less of those. Speaking of Scorsese, he was giving an interview recently on some of his press rounds, and he was talking about the importance of seeing what have been deemed independent films, get screen time, get run time, take up theater space. You know, and even thinking about someone like Paul Thomas Anderson, who is one of the premier, quote unquote, independent filmmakers of our time, I was reading some statistic that over his last four movies, they've run, you know, in theaters for a total of less than 12 weeks. I got to find the statistic and we'll put it in the notes. But this idea of even someone Mm -hmm. like PTA, who is operating at the peak of independent cinema, 
is not necessarily getting you know that space. So it's it's also an industry wide problem where you have these massive corporations who are incredibly over leveraged, who are billions of dollars in debt, who have broken the model of economics that worked by and large over the last century, and it will be really interesting to see what this next season in the industry looks like. But I think those of us who want to see those stories about people living their lives and the human experience, we're going to have to really fight for those because I think our industry has lost sight of that is our role or that is our function. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think they care. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I, know that's, I know that's fucked up to say at the same time. I'm like, dang, they really don't care, but maybe they do. I don't know. I know. It's hard because, again, it's like that business piece of it, right? It's the money. It's like ultimately like – they're like, well, well, it's not making money. We want it to make money. And you're like, well, I get that too. So what's the solution? You know, like I, it's, yeah. it's very, I, I'm always in my mind about that stuff as well. I'm always like, well, how do we do, how do we fix this? Yes. Cause I, I don't know that I have the answer. <laughs> well, yeah. that was my next question for you, actually. <laughs> There's two parts to this, you know, concerning this topic of cultural box, like what are solutions and ideas for change that you can think of. I don't expect you to have the answers, but if you have any ideas or thoughts of how we can change this moving forward, or how do we get people who are in our industry to kind of take action and figure out solutions for this? I kind of shot myself in the foot there, huh? I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, uh, hold on, let me think of some solutions. Um, I don't, you know, I'm going to be honest. Yeah, that's where I'm at, where I'm like, I'm uncertain, right? I mean, we've had this big win with, with our contract with the WGA, which is awesome. I think that's such a huge, you know, saying a lot about labor and like what we as a society and people want. And we're all working towards taking back the power, right, from from corporations. We're trying to re- remind them that we are the people who are buying things. We are the people who are helping them make their money, right? There's something positive there. It means that the people have power. And like, that's a good thing. I personally feel like the issues are a lot of what we discussed during this this conversation, which is like the gamble that needs to be made on a lot of different types of content from different communities. Like there is some gambling that's been happening in the last few years, I would say, but it's not quite been done in a way that makes the most, how do I put it? You can make the gamble on content, but when then you don't invest in proper amount of production budgets and marketing budgets, you can't call that having actually tried. Because if you're trying to call equality in content, but it's not equality in budgets, then it's not equality. It's not the same. It's not equity. So it's like when you start to actually do that and do a lot of different projects in that way, and when you can really say that like people behind the camera creating a show – do represent those communities and stuff to so in some way, then I think you're getting closer. I just don't think the industry has really done that yet. And and the hard thing with this industry is that they'll do something, they'll be like, well, we tried, it didn't work, it sucked, mm. gotta go this way. Mm-hmm. Um, without being uh, without allowing themselves to be subject to scrutiny, right? So not not showing people numbers, not showing people budgets. It's like, well, if you don't show us exactly side by side what we're looking at. And then you're not letting yourself be critiqued, right? Um, because the reality is when we do look at it, when we look at stuff that researchers have done recently, um, you know, just recently, Ana Cristina Ramon, she released a, a study that showed that most BIPOC shows had a significantly lower production budget mm-hmm. than white shows mm-hmm. and significantly lower budget in marketing than white shows. So, yes, yeah, awesome. You, you greenlit a few of our shows and they're a little bit diverse in story. But you made it your charity case versus really investing to the degree that it takes to invest. Because when you're asking BIPOC creators and directors to do the same thing for half the money, you're asking them to break themselves Mm -hmm. to create this thing for you. And then you turn around and gaslight them and say it's your fault that it didn't work, right? Like the, the content is just not reaching people. They don't like it. We did all the things. Look at all the things we did. But it's like, well, okay, well, compared to what? And I think that's what was hard about that comparison to that show for me uh, and being told, oh, well, there's no, we didn't give them any money, right? Mm -hmm. Again, one, that's not a thing to admit to because that's also not great. But also, 
is that really comparable, right? An international series that was already made that you licensed compared to what you, it's just it's a very all of it, right? Mm-hmm. There, there were a lot of there was a lot of comps that were made, and again, I know I don't want to. I say this with a lot of love for the folks over there because we had nothing but good experiences. But I think it's with everything. It starts at the very, very top. Like the people on the ground don't represent what's happening at the very, very top. And so that gentle push for accountability was me saying, hey, I know you all are humans. And I know that you do this work because you love the art. And none of us chose to come into an industry based on money, at least most of us, some of us did, but most of us chose to come into it for the art. So, like, think about that. What can you do through your access, through your abilities at this place to make a change or a difference or to question or to ask more or to say, hey, maybe the next one needs to have a different budget or, or marketing or all the things, right? So I think it's that. It's, like, really pushing where equity and budgets is a big thing for me. And I talk about it often because I do think it makes a big difference. Or at least you're, you haven't proved me wrong until I've seen that, right? Like you could tell me all day the numbers aren't matching, but like, but they're not. They're not. The numbers aren't matching in viewership, but they're not matching on the other side either. So like, tell me once you have that matching, then you could tell me it's not working. And then I could be like, okay, my bad. You're right. You did everything you could. It matches all your white shows and still nothing. Cool. Then that show just didn't make it. Um, but that hasn't been the case. So I just, I'm going to keep questioning it for that reason. I really love that where it's in some ways, it's just rejecting a faulty premise. It's like, you're saying that these things yeah. don't measure up, but you have not made them equal. And I think just the refusal to accept that and take that as proof positive that, you know, these shows don't work. And in some ways like mm-hmm. that's, I think it just as an idea of like, how will we know when we're actually being held to the right scrutiny is when there is transparency about those things and there is equality in those things. And it's like, let's, let's, let's put them pound for pound. You know, let's measure these things accordingly and make sure that, that this is a fair and equal rather than a separate, but equal, you know, way of, of comparison. Yeah. And that every, honestly, every network is different. Like what's a hit on one network, it, it may not measure up on another one. So the numbers we pulled would make us a huge hit on another network. There's so Mm -hmm. many layers to it, but just what the public sees is what the public sees. But it's really a network can determine if they decide something's a hit or not, right? Yeah. Like if it's got the numbers, they can say, this is a hit. And then you're like, oh, okay, let's all go watch it. But their numbers might not be anything compared to what's even a low level show on another network or another streaming network like a Netflix, right? So it's just, it's confusing. It's confusing about like, what are the, what are the parameters, right? Like, what's good enough? Well, thank you so much. You are so inspiring. And actually, you had a great solution. I think you you talked through what could be a really good actionable plan for people is invest. And that's important. Like, invest and don't make us the charity case. That's, to me, just a great statement. I was wondering if you have any, like, last minute philosophical musings or inspiring thoughts on our topic today of the cultural box. Oh, man, it's always like I'm always between like, God, everything sucks. <laughs> and, then at the same time, and then at the same time being like, no, you can do it. That's like my day to day. Right. So yeah. I think I would say that in Spanish, you would say estamos en la lucha. like we're in the fight. We're in the we are in the battle. And like and the battle is our freedom to be who we are. And that that is not actually something that people can actually take from you, that it is yours to own. And that when you are being put into boxes in this industry, that you can step away from that box at any time. And the ways that I come back to myself is through my loved ones, whether that's family or friends. It's a reminder of like, oh, this industry doesn't matter. The art does. One of my best friends said this to me. We traveled together recently and you know, I was telling her about my struggles with the industry and she was like, quit the industry, don't quit the art. And I thought that that was such a beautiful quote. I want to get a t-shirt with that on it. (laughs) Cause I was just like, yeah, (laughs) like quit the industry, don't quit the art. Like you can still be in this industry doing your art, but you don't have to participate always in the dynamics 
that are toxic or the dynamics that make you feel less than who you are. Because at the end of the day, like that's really what matters. If you're if you don't feel like you, then what? What's it all for? Still, we still matter as humans, even if we are vessels for story. Even if we did get called to do this, we still also get to protect ourselves. We still also get to be full humans who have joy and happiness, and we don't need to be taken apart by this industry. We don't have to be put into boxes, taken apart, put into other boxes. Like we get to choose which doors we walk through and who we hold hands with in this journey. And so know that and hold on to that at every turn. And um, yeah, and just connect with it. Connect with your loved ones. They always bring you back. In the most surprising way, sometimes you're just like, oh shit, that's right. I'm just, this is, oh, this is why I'm doing this. Like, it's so important. Um, So, yeah. I love that. I needed to hear that on this Monday morning. I really did. Me too. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) Me too. I think that's what I said. That shit comes from the universe. And I'm like, oh, okay, you want me to hear that too? Yeah. So, yeah, Yeah. thank you. I want to thank you again so much for speaking with us. Thanks, Linda. I appreciate you too. Thank you. Bye. Our website is filmphilosophy.com. That's film and then philosophy with an F.com. There you can find educational resources and our contact info. For you guys to ask some questions and follow up if you want to, our email is filmphilosophy.tme at gmail.com. We encourage you to send us audio messages by email so we can play it back on our podcast. But if you're shy, all good too. Thank you so much for listening, my friends. We had so much fun with this topic that we kept talking after we wrapped the episode. So please enjoy some bonus content from our chat. You can find it on our website, filmphilosophy.com. Again, that is film and then philosophy with an F.com. This is Film Philosophy, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>